Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Sharpstown Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us today, thank you so much for, for coming out. Um, in fact, if you are visiting today and you haven't filled out one of these before, I ask that you do so now. At the door, you were given a bulletin, and on the outside cover, there's a guest information card. If you would fill that out, tear it out, we are going to have a welcome center in the back of the church. I'd like to have a chance to get to meet you, and we also have a, a small gift for you as well. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements, and they're Christmas-related. I've got uh, the youth Christmas party this Friday, so if you have youth-aged children that have signed up for the party, we're going ice skating at the Galleria and eating at the Rainforest Cafe. Make sure you have your kids here by 6 o'clock on Friday. Uh, also, we have deacons, and uh, I'm sorry, not deacons, we have council meeting today. Uh, that's at, uh, at 4 right? Four o'clock this afternoon. Also, I want to remind you about Jingle Bell Express. Please, guys, if you haven't done so already, bring in an unwrapped gift for a child. Uh, drop it off there in the back of the church every year. Uh, as you know, Sharpstown Bas Baptist participates in Jingle Bell Express, and that's through CCSC. Amazing program where it really impacts uh, the impoverished here in the area. If you bring out a toy, it's going to go to, uh, to a needy child this Christmas. Thank you. Please stand.
This morning's scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. The Lord will bring on you and your people and on your house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Hello, good morning. morning. Let's bow out in prayer. This morning I'll be reading from um, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time of the year. Lord, today our prayer is that you will be real to us as you were with the apostle 
John, we pray that we will respect your presence, Lord. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, your influence will be palpable in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we pray for restraint when we are angry because you are real to us. We pray for gracious words to emanate from our lips when we are tempted to gossip because you are real to us. Lord, we pray for forgiveness when we are tempted to hold grudges because you are real to us. We pray that we will turn away from idle talk and speak only that which builds up. Lord, we pray that you let others see your influence in us. Lord, we thank you for this time of the year. It reminds us that you became flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, be real in our lives today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, your word tells us that your people, Israel, were in great darkness. They were lost in religion and sin and had no hope in and of themselves of salvation. The manner for which they were to worship that you set for them through Moses was impossible to attain. You could not be righteous. Into that darkness, a light shone. You took on flesh. You walked this earth that you created, this fallen creation, and you gave your life for us. This morning, we remember with anticipation the coming child, and we say, oh, come. Emmanuel, God with us, thank you for your love, your great love. In your name we pray, amen. Let's look at our scripture together this morning, Matthew chapter 1, as we begin to look at the coming of the Messiah, the birth of Jesus. You know, if you think about it, For Him, who was a contemporary Christian group that sang several years ago, wrote a song called, What a Strange Way to Save the World. And it really was. It really was. This is not at all the way they were expecting the Messiah to come. Being a political Messiah, they expected Him to come and, and to be born into a wealthy family and to, to be riding in chariots instead of on a donkey. But God had a different plan in mind. And I want you to think just for a moment from God's perspective. I want you to think that that you have just had a child. And now you must find a family to raise that child. What would you look for in a family? You know, God knew what he was looking for whenever he chose Mary. And when he chose Joseph. Both descendants of David. uh, Both could be tracked back to the king. And yet, instead of choosing majesty, and instead of choosing wealth, he chose just ordinary people, just just an ordinary man and an ordinary girl. And and he said, these will be the the physical, earthly parents of my son. And this morning, I want us to look at what was it that made Joseph so unique? A lot of times at Christmas, we focus on Mary. I love the the offertory that was played, Mary, Did You Know? And one of the reasons I love that song is because it proves that there is a God. Because if you know who wrote that, it was written by a man by the name of Mark Lowry. And so if you know anything at all about Mark Lowry, you know that, that he, he takes ADD to the other extreme. If there was another DDD you could add to Mark Lowry, that's what you would add. But for him to write, Mary, Did You Know? Truly a God thing. And so we look at Mary oftentimes, and we think of her, but this morning I want us to focus on why Joseph? What was it about Joseph that God chose this person, this man, to raise his son? That God chose Joseph to be the earthly father of Jesus. And and we really don't know how long Joseph influenced Jesus But we do know for at least 12 years, Joseph was in Jesus' life. We know that in the formative years of growing up, that Joseph was there to teach, that he was there to train, that he was there to, to disciple Jesus. And so, why Joseph? Well, let's look in Matthew chapter 1 and beginning in verse 18. And let's stand together and look at God's calling upon Joseph's life. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. And before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save uh, his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, the virgin will be with child, 
and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. Father, I thank you for the godliness in Joseph's life. And I pray that you would, you would develop in each of us the de desire to serve you in such a way that we would be that person that you would choose, that we would be that individual that you could use, Lord. I pray, Father, for the things that are in our life right now, that as you look and you say, I just can't use that, that you would convict us of that and that we would repent of that and that we would be set free so like Joseph, we could live in absolute obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing that we look at is the obstacles that Joseph faced. There were several obstacles in his life. One was, can you imagine what it would be like to grow up generation after generation after generation and there was no word from God? There was no fresh word from God. Everything was simply repeated. But God had not revealed himself in over 400 years to the Israelites. Now they knew in their history what this was like because the same thing had happened when Israel was taken captive by Egypt and lived in Egyptian captivity for 400 years, there was no word from God. And so now we see at the close of the Old Testament until God begins to manifest himself to uh, Mary's uncle, to, to Joseph, to Mary, to Elizabeth, to all of these individuals, that it had been 400 years since there had been a fresh word from God. So one of the obstacles in Joseph's life was that... that People just didn't have words from God. They didn't have communications with God. And so he was going through a time where, where he was living in obedience to God without any word from God. He was simply looking at the, at the Old Testament. He was looking at the laws of the Old Testament. He was looking at the requirements of the Old Testament. And he had patterned his life according to the commands of God in the Old Testament. You see, Joseph had all these plans in life. But he, one thing we know about Joseph is that he was a righteous man. The scripture says that he was a man that lived according to the word of God. It was a choice that he made probably because of the way that he was raised. Maybe even the way that his father was raised. All the way back, they had done a good job of raising their children right... And as a result of this, Joseph had lived a righteous life. But yet he lived this righteous life without any influence by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon the church, without any word from God other than the, the Old Testament. He chose to live this righteous life. And one of the, but this was an obstacle that he faced, that he was pretty much on his own living a righteous life. There just weren't a lot of, of good examples for him to follow. Certainly the scribes, the Pharisees, and the priests were not good examples for him to, to follow because all they were concerned about was not righteousness but religion. They weren't concerned about doing the right thing for the right reason. And so Joseph had taken upon himself to live this moral life, to live this righteous life, to live this holy life. And it had not gone unnoticed by God. And so we see this obstacle. So how old is Joseph? I am convinced that Joseph was somewhere around 20, 20 years old. Early 20s. I know that there are scholars who say that no. He was much older than Mary. And that he had already been married once. And that he had other children. But I do not believe that. I believe that he, he and Mary were partners for the, for, the, for the first time in each other's lives. And they had already gone through the betrothal. They had already gone through the engagement. And now they were officially married according to their custom. But they had not gone through with the marriage ceremony. And then not only is he faced with the obstacle of being out there by himself and yet choosing to be a righteous individual, he's also faced with the obstacle of having that righteousness pretty much thrown up in his face because the woman that he was about to marry, and I want you to understand something, romantic love really didn't make its way into our culture till about the 19th century. Now, do I believe that there were those who, 
who fell in love and got married? Yes, I believe that there was love at first sight. I think there always has been love at first sight. But I don't know that Joseph and Mary would fall into this as much as this was an arranged marriage by their parents. And perhaps he looked at Mary and there was a spark, but it had not yet blown into full-fledged love. But because he was a righteous man, whenever he found out... Now think about it, guys, not from the Scripture's perspective, but from Joseph's perspective... When he found out that she had been unfaithful to him, he could have had her stoned for that unfaithfulness. That was within the law. He could have had her put to death because she had been in a relationship with another man and this child that she was carrying was not his. But he didn't want to do that. Obviously, he felt something for Mary. But he also knew that this was not part of his plan for life. So what he did was he was going to divorce her. Now what Mary's position would have been was that she would have had to have raised this child upon her own and she would have lived with her parents for the rest of her life and she would have never married again. But Joseph at least had enough compassion for her to not have her put to death but to divorce her and to do it quietly. Not to make a big deal about it. Not to, not to take the... The low road, but to take the high road and not to draw attention to what Mary had done. He just wanted to make sure that she was going to be okay. And so can you imagine all these obstacles that he was facing? And yet he was a righteous man. And it was because of that righteousness that God had a great plan for Joseph. That God was going to include him in something greater than himself. And so we see the opportunities that Joseph experienced. The opportunity, think about this. The opportunity to be the earthly father of the Messiah. The opportunity to to be there from the birth. Walk him through his life. Can you imagine some of the discussions that Joseph must have had with Jesus? Can you imagine the relationship that they must have had? Can you imagine the influence that he had on Jesus' life? You see, a lot of times we don't think of Jesus as a baby. We don't think of Jesus as, as having a dirty diaper. We don't think of Jesus as having a runny nose. We don't think of Jesus as having a crush on the little girl that lived down the road. I know that Max Lucado one time wrote about how we don't think of Jesus like that. And a lady wrote to him and said, The Messiah that I served never had a crush on the little girl that lived down the road. He said, I'm not saying that she did, but isn't it wonderful to know that he could? We don't think of him like that. But Joseph did. Joseph had the opportunity here to be a part of something so much greater than he ever dreamed possible. What was Joseph's dream for this life? To be a carpenter. To to go ahead and and marry this, this beautiful little girl that God had brought into his life. To have a family, to to just be a righteous man and to raise righteous children and and to just, just please God as best he could. And God steps in and he intervened in Joseph's plans and he said, Joseph, that may have been your plan, but I've got another plan for your life. And this plan is not going to be an easy plan. There's going to be whispers from now on. No matter where you go with Mary... There are going to be whispers. People are always going to question the fatherhood of this child. They're always going to wonder who is the real dad for Mary. They're always going to be talking about how Mary was unfaithful to you. But yet it is amazing the opportunity that Joseph had. The opportunity that was laid before him. What opportunity? The opportunity to to have Jesus. Jesus. Yahweh saves is what his name means. That he has come to save us from our sin. You see, not the political Messiah that came to save him from the Roman government. but But the spiritual Messiah that came to save people from eternal damnation. That came to save them and to save us from that separation from God. And so he tells him, he says, you are to be the the earthly father of the one who will come and the one that is to save. 
And so every time he would call the name of Jesus, every time he would, he would work with Jesus, every time he would think of Jesus, he would think of, this is the little boy that has come to save the world. And it was a constant reminder to Joseph of even though he had given up so much to be obedient to God, he was giving so much to the world. He was a man who, who had this opportunity just laid in his lap. And he says that his name would be Emmanuel. Can you imagine? I think about the discussion that Joseph and Mary must have had. I mean, my goodness, I don't think Joseph just went to Mary and said, Hey, listen, I had a dream and, and God told me that this baby that you're carrying is not from another man. He is from the Holy Spirit. He is going to be the Messiah. He has come to save the world. His name is going to be Jesus. And, and that's the end of the discussion. I want you to use your kind of spiritual imagination and go back to the very beginning when Joseph first found out that Mary was expecting a child. Can you imagine what went through Joseph's mind? Can you imagine what he thought when he found out that he had never been with her and yet here she was going to have a baby? And she would say to him, but Joseph, I'm still a virgin. Now, goodness gracious, 2,000 years later, we've heard the story so many times that we don't think that much about it. But for Joseph, this would have been the first time he had heard, actually met someone who was expecting a child that had never been with a man before. And he would have said, Mary, I find that hard to believe. That's never happened before. And Mary would have said, yes, but remember Joseph in Isaiah chapter 7 where God said that a virgin shall be with child? Now, in our society, we criticize people that use Scripture to reinforce their behavior. I know people that will misuse Scripture to justify some action in their life. But Mary this scripture was specifically about her. Isaiah was talking about Mary. And she said, I am that virgin. I can imagine Joseph would have said, if it had been me, I know what I would have said. I would have said, yeah, right. <laughs> so I can imagine the discussion that they had before. But after the dream, can you imagine the conversations they had over and over again about this baby that was given to them? So when they go through the difficult times, when they go through the hard times, when they go through the, the times of wondering uh, what people were saying, the judgmental stares, the whispers, when they go through all of this, not only were they reminded that this baby was named Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, but he was also named Emmanuel, God with us. That no matter what Joseph and Mary went through, God's with us. No matter what we experience, God's with us. Even when we run away from a, a leader, a political leader that is killing every male child and we go into Egypt and we don't know anybody there we don't know what we're going to do we know one thing God's with us you see it's not just that his name is that he has come to save us because he has come to save us from our sin his name is also that no matter what we go through he is with us through that that he will never leave us nor forsake us and Joseph was constantly reminded of this opportunity as the earthly father of the Messiah that Jesus had come to save and he had come to destroy the barrier between us and God so that we can be reminded that God not only saves us from our sins and calls us into eternity with Him, but no matter what we experience in this world, God is with us through that. You see, that's the opportunity. And that's the opportunity. Why Joseph? Because he was a carpenter and he could teach Jesus how to build things and Jesus would need that skill until he was 30 before he started his earthly ministry. Uh, maybe, maybe that's a good skill. But I mean, any of these men could have taught Jesus how to, how to do something for a living. Why Joseph? I think it goes back to 
Joseph being a righteous man. You see, we see that Joseph said yes. We see not only the obstacles that he experienced and not only the opportunity he encountered, but we also see the obedience that he expressed. He didn't question God. He didn't say, wait a minute, God, you know, especially in a dream. You know, I think one of the things that God would have to do to me is not speak to me in a dream because I doubt the dreams that I have. But he didn't doubt this dream. He did he was just absolutely obedient to what God had called him to do. So why Joseph? Because Joseph said yes. You see, we can look at Joseph and we can say, God, you gave Joseph a really big job. One of the biggest jobs in the history of the universe. You gave Joseph. And I want to tell you, God, that, that if you were to ever ask me to do anything like that, if you were to ever call me to do, to do anything even close to being the earthly father of the Messiah, I would do it. I would do whatever big thing you ask me to do. I make myself available to you so that whatever great, grandiose, majestic thing you call me to do, I will do it. God says, I don't want you to be obedient with the big things as much as I want you to be obedient with the little things. And God, we say, well, I don't want to do the little things for you, God. I want to do the big things for you. You see, God chooses people to serve him differently than we as a church choose people to serve him. Oftentimes as a church, we will choose someone to serve who... Who's been coming to the church a long time. You know, they, they, they've been consistent in their giving or they've been consistent in their attendance. And so therefore, they need to be serving God somewhere. So we give them a title. The problem is, oftentimes, they're not really, no matter how long they've been here, they're not ready for a title. They're not ready for a leadership position. I can't tell you the number of people that I have served with in leadership positions in a church that had a leadership position thrust upon them by the church, but their spiritual maturity was so poor that they had no idea what they were doing and the church had to suffer because of that. You see, God doesn't choose a servant based on longevity. God chooses a servant based on righteousness. And that's what he did in Joseph's life. I see so many people that, that say they want to serve God. I see so many people that want this spiritual authority within the body of Christ. I see so many people that are, that are wanting the limelight. They're wanting the, the, to do the big things. They're wanting to be a part of the grandiose uh, work of God. But they're not being obedient with the little things. And that's where God looks as, a, as an individual that, that's obedient with the small things. That lives the everyday righteousness of God. So that he can choose to give them the big jobs in life. That's why he chose Joseph. Joseph was faithful in the littlest of things. Joseph was faithful in the day-to-day -day things. Joseph was a man who... Who when he sinned, he repented. Who recognized his sin. Who, who strived without the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. To be the very best man that he could possibly be. Despite the circumstances that he was in. Despite the example of others around him. He chose to be that very best man that he could be. And God rewarded him for that by giving him an amazing job. You see, we want the job, and then we want to clean up our life. And it simply doesn't work that way. Joseph was the man that was written about in this book. We don't know a lot about him. After Jesus turns 12, he disappears from the pages of Scripture. But we do know... That he was the man that God chose. Because of the way he lived his life day to day. You see. 
God doesn't want us to be faithful in the big stuff. As he wants us to be faithful in the day-to-day stuff. I see so many leaders in our churches today. That are living not righteous lives. But still want to have the influence. Joseph had influence over Jesus. Not because he was in authority as a parent. But because of what he had chosen to do in his life. To live that righteous life. To take Jesus' mother and make her his wife. To live in obedience to God. To influence the Messiah for the first few years of his life. Guys, i got to be honest. That's the kind of man I want to be. But I know God will never give me the big job. Until I'm faithful with the day-to-day stuff. Let's stand together. Father, I pray that you help us to recognize that. You're calling us to be faithful with the everyday stuff. You're calling us to be faithful with with the here and now. That you're calling us to live righteous and holy lives. And that, Father, we will never be used by you in a supernatural way until we get this together. So I pray, first of all, for every leader that is in our church. I pray that we would all live righteous and holy and moral lives so that you could do supernatural things through us. I pray for every father that is in this church. I pray like Joseph, they recognize the influence that they have. Not on the Messiah, but on the future leaders of the church. I pray, Father, that that we would be righteous in our day-to-day walk with you. So that when you do reveal the big things for us to do, we're ready. Father, it starts in our intimacy with you. It starts in our relationship with you. I pray, Father, that we would walk with you in a day-to-day relationship unseen by those around us, but known by you. And I pray that we start that this very moment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thou didst keep thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity? Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. the angels sang, proclaiming thy royal scene. But of holy birth did thou come to earth, and in great humility. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is Amen. I just want to remind you, uh, first of all, aren't the, aren't the decorations gorgeous? Man, I love this. Thank you, those of you that have, that have put these up. It is always beautiful every year. Uh, I want to remind you about our Christmas cards. There's the mailbox back there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, put, you can put Christmas cards for people that are uh, in church. You understand? Sometimes what we've gotten is we've gotten people that were homebound, are people that were not actively involved in church, and we have no way of getting those cards to those individuals unless we mail them, and then that takes away from our offering, so we don't do that. So please do this. If you do use the mailbox, uh, get, make your offering for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Put a return address on there so that we can get it back to you if that person does not come to church. 
uh, because we, we, we're not, we don't mail them or because, like I said, it would take away from the offering. So begin to bring your, your Christmas cards for those that are actively involved in our church. Put them in the mailbox, and we'll make sure they get distributed. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Looking forward to this Christmas season together. We love you very much. And join hands as we sing in departing this morning. Hail the head born prince of peace, hail the son of righteousness, light and light. 